Kevin worked for three different nonprofits in Illinois, focusing on clean air, solid waste planning, recycling. Subsequent to that work as an advocate and a lobbyist, he then spent 20 years with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. There his charge was pollution prevention, green government, and product stewardship initiatives. And I'm sure we'll hear about product stewardship this evening. As a volunteer, Kevin also serves on the Tucson Pima County Bicycle Advisory Committee. And I'm sure he would advise us all if we feel up to it to ride our bikes as much as we can. So Kevin, we are really glad to have you everybody. We go till 7.30. Kevin's going to talk somewhere 40 minutes, maybe longer. We will have question and answer. After question and answer, I've got two questions I would like to ask of everyone present. And you don't have to answer, but I will invite everyone present to give their thought on those two questions. And I'll, I'll see those questions now. The first one is, what do you most want to see us do as a community here in Tucson and a larger metro area? What do you want us, us to do to reduce zero waste most powerfully, most effectively? Not reduce zero waste, reduce waste to zero. Second question is, what might be a first step we could take? So those are the questions I'll put to everybody. Feel free to take notes, put things in the chat as you always do. And Kevin, um, I will be here, though sometimes I will be silent or invisible, but I will be here the whole time with you. So looking forward to your talk as always. All right, great. Thank you, Stuart, for the introduction. And thank you everybody for taking time uh, to uh, attend the meeting tonight. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a, a warning. I tend to pack stuff into my PowerPoint presentations, and I know it's, you know, it goes against all the advice you get. But I, I, I just, I just do it, and I've, I've, and, and so bear with me as we go through the presentation. Uh, also, I'm going to, I'm not really going to talk about how to live a, a low impact or zero waste lifestyle. We had a great speaker. Uh, Sharia De Jardine, who did a, uh, a wonderful presentation uh, last year on things that individuals can do in the community to uh, live more sustainably, uh, generate less waste. I'm going to talk more about policies and programs um, that I think could be should be looked into uh, at the local level, at the state level, and also at the at the federal level. And one, one theme you're gonna hear from me tonight mm -hmm. is, is we've, we just can't continue to, to dump this problem, this waste management problem on local governments. That's not working. They don't have the resources. Uh, it has to be more of a shared responsibility that involves the private sector, uh, involves uh, the communities, neighborhoods, as well as individuals. So that's gonna be kind of a common theme that you'll hear from me. Um, what I'm gonna do uh, sort of as an outline, I'm, I'll provide some background information on solid waste generation recycling trends, uh, both globally and also uh, at the federal level or in the United States. I wanna review some of the challenges that are facing re this recycling industry. And I, the point I'm really gonna hammer on is we can't recycle our way out of this, this growing waste crisis that we're facing. It's, it's just not gonna happen, it's not gonna work. Uh, recycling has kind of hit a ceiling and we need to think, really rethink recycling and waste management. Um, and it's a good time to do that as communities like Tucson focus on climate change, uh, sustainability, um, you know, dealing with our waste, in a more effective manner is going to help, help us address climate change in the long term. I'm gonna outline some steps for creating a zero waste community. Uh, and then I'll provide some examples um, of communities around the country that have embraced zero waste um, concepts. And I'll talk a little bit about the city of Tucson's zero waste planning initiative and some of the things that we've, uh, recommendations that we've made to the city. Um, and how they might want to move forward with a zero waste plan. Uh, you know, sometimes you got to 
sort of figure out where you are before you can figure out how to move forward. And I, I, you know, this is not going to it's not going to be new information for, for most of you, but we we live in a disposable society. Um, we don't value the importance of materials and resources. We buy products with limited understanding of where they come or where they go. We sort of have this out of sight, out of mind attitude when it comes to waste. Um, once we deliver to our, 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 our trash cart or our recycling bin, um, our production system, not just in this country, but in most other industrialized or developed countries, it's a one-way system uh, from the earth to disposal. And, and, and you know, some of the zero waste experts sort of refer to it as take, make, use, and waste. Those are the, the four, four key components of our linear production system. And then in the last 60 years, um, our product and marketing decisions are, you know, made by uh, the consumer good, the brand companies, have been dominated by design for convenience and disposability. And, and again, we've really seen that uh, with the uh, greater use of, of single use packaging. Some uh, factoids or background information, the amount of garbage that humans are throwing away is rising fast. Um, waste production's risen tenfold worldwide in the past century. Trash is being generated faster than other environmental pollutants, including uh, greenhouse gases. The world currently generates about a little over 2 billion tons of municipal solid waste annually. And by 2050, if, if we don't make changes, if we continue business as usual, the world's expected to generate about 3.4 billion tons of solid waste annually. Many of our natural resources are being stretched to their limits. Um, the amount of material that the world uses has tripled since 1970, and it could double again by 2060. Again, if we, do, if we continue sort of business as usual mode. Um, this next figure is, I think is kind of interesting. Uh, uh, natural, uh, it was, comes from the United Nations and World Bank, but natural resources that are used to satisfy a person's needs. Um, in 1990, 8.1 tons of resources were extracted per person. Um, in 2015, almost 20 tons of resources were extracted. That's a pretty, pretty good jump over a 25 year period. Well, focus on waste generation and recycling trends here in the United States. And as you can see from that, graph the uh, the amount of municipal municipal solid waste msw produced in the united states has has risen steadily um, in 1960 uh, less than three pounds uh, of waste were generated per person per day that increased to 3.66 pounds per person per day in 1980 and in, in 2018 it rose to 4.9 pounds per person per day. So, you know, we, uh, even with recycling and other things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of trying to minimize our waste, we're going in the wrong direction. What makes up this municipal solid waste stream? Uh, this should be no surprise. Uh, paper and paperwork products still make up the largest percentage, um, followed by food, uh, yard trimmings, plastics, and glass and metals. But what's interesting is that three quarter, now three quarters of our waste, of our municipal waste are products and packaging. So that's kind of changed over, over the last 60 years. Um, when you look at waste composition um, and, and the trends, uh, you'll see how, and see how it's changed over time. You'll, you'll see that there's been a drop in paper and paperboard uh, waste. Um, and that's not, you know, I, you know with, with uh, electronic communication, storage of information, sharing information on the internet and so on. That's, you know, that, you know, that, that's a, that should be expected. 
plastics products, waste gener waste has gone up, um, which is again, no surprise. And the, the one uh, bit of information that really caught my eye when I was preparing this presentation was that food waste has increased from 30.7 million tons in 2010 to 63. million tons in 2018. Uh, it's doubled. Um, um, and that's um, over uh, less than 10 years. So that's that's pretty significant. Something we need to really uh, keep focused on. What happens to our waste? Um, and you know, where does it go? And landfilling is still the predominant waste management method. 50% of our municipal solid waste was landfilled in 2018. Food was the largest component of the materials landfilled. Plastics were now accounted for 18%, paper and paperboard 12%, and then other miscellaneous materials 11%. Um, the amount of municipal solid waste combustion with energy recovery increased from zero in 1960 to 14% in 1990, it dropped a bit in 2018. Um, Waste energy incineration tends to be as as it has tended to be used more in the midwestern part of the country, the northeast, um, and so starting in the uh, 70s and 80s, I don't think there's been a minutes waste incinerator that's been built since the mid 1990s. I could be wrong on that, but it's probably why uh, we saw a little drop in municipal solid waste combustion in, in 2018 because some of these older incinerators are being phased out. Recycling trends over the last 60 years. Um, we look at recycling and composting rates. Just over 6% of municipal solid waste was recycled or composted in 1960. That jumped to 10% in 1980, 16% in 1990, 29% in 2000, 35% in 2017, and it decreased to 32%. In 2018, so we saw some, you know, pretty significant jump in recycling and composting rates. Uh, right around the mid 80s, uh, continued through the the 90s, but after that rise, the our recycling and composting rates are, have started to flatten out uh, over the last 10 years. In when we look at recycling by material type. Um, You'll see that about 66%, this is 2018 data, 66% of discarded paper and cardboard were recycled. This is um, yeah. uh, national information. 25% of the glass was recycled, 9% of plastics were recycled, and 63% of your trippings were composted. Um, I, I come from Illinois, and in, in the late 80s, the, our legislature passed a law that basically said, you can't dispose of yard waste in landfills. You have to come up with something different. Of course, we still have a fair amount of um, open burning going on in, in Illinois, but most municipalities, especially the larger ones, shifted over to uh, composting very early on. I want to focus on plastics. And why? Because the use of plastics has increased 20 fold in the past 50 years. And um, I, I wanted to, that's why I wanted to zero in on some of the challenges that we have with recycling plastics. Uh, packaging and single use items account for about 40% of the plastic that's produced every year. The rigid plastic packaging, the ones and twos are, are for example, are commonly recycled, but the recycling rates are still low in the sense that half of the PET bottles sold like the soda pop bottles, it's never collected for recycling. We don't see a lot of one-to-one -one recycling with plastic, much of it is downsized. And when you, when you look at, at, at bottles, plastic bottles, 10% of the bottles were collected, were only 10% of the bottles collected were turned into new bottles. Much of that plastic has been down, is, is down, what they call downcycled into. Um, and you don't see the one-to-one -one recycling that you see perhaps with aluminum can and, and in the old, back in the day with glass bottles. 
Um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, with flexible packaging, you, you, you see a lot of uh, different types of um, resins and multi-materials being used. And when I talk about flat, flexible packaging, I'm talking about wrappers and snack bags and pouches. There's been a real jump in the use of flexible packaging. And the problem is it's, off, it's often made of multiple materials, uh, resins, that, you know, three, four, 10 layers of different resins or it's paper and plastic uh, that's been layered together with an adhesive or a wax. And, and our, our materials recovery facilities really are challenged trying to, to recycle these items. There, there's not really a good market for them. And then the small plastic pieces are also difficult to recover. Uh, they, also, they often fall through the sorting screens at the materials recovery facility. I, I mentioned earlier about how our, our recycling rate has sort of flattened out. It's been holding at around 32% uh, for the past desk, decade. And, and I wanna talk a little bit about the reasons for that. Um, first and foremost, the cities have limited budgets for recycling programs. and. You know, recycling competes, uh, waste management competes with social services, public safety, um, economic development, and so on. And it doesn't fare too well. Uh, it's, it's not going to be the top priority for most cities. Um, and so there's just so much that the cities can do. Um, in fact, some cities, we'll get into that in a minute, have cut back on their recycling programs. Um, again, we have a wide range of materials and products in use today, you know, over the last 60 years. So that causes operational challenges at the materials recovery facilities. A lot of our materials get co-mingled together um, and you have food contaminated multi-material items that, that tend to be harder to, to market. They're lower value. Uneven services, what consumers and businesses recycle varies greatly across the country. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit uh, later on. Um, still have an abundance of landfill space. I, I remember back in the 80s, several states had come out with reports saying that we were going to run out of landfill space. Well, that, that, uh, that didn't happen. And, and, um, and we, we did see, uh, you know, the waste management industry, actually what they started to do they're having a hard time citing new landfills or mega fills, large landfills. So they started buying existing landfills and getting permission to, to expand those landfills. So we, we still have an abundance of landfill space nationwide. Uh, again, on the East and Midwest, we have waste to energy plants that have what are called put or, or pay contracts. They have to guarantee a certain amount of material uh, uh, or fuel for, for, for those waste energy plants. Uh, that's kind of stymied recycling somewhat. And then we, you know, especially in the last 20 years, we've seen a sharp reduction of state and federal funding for recycling programs. A lot of the initial programs were in the 70s and early 80s were run by nonprofit organizations. And then recycling got privatized in the mid 80s, early 90s. And there was funding available for municipalities to buy um, um, recycling bins uh, for the private sector to uh, uh, purchase recycling carts and also equipment, recycling equipment for the materials recovery facilities. So, but all that, those funds have pretty much dried up over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Want to talk a little bit about recent developments that have impacted recycling. Um, a, a big one that occurred in 2018, China in, in enacted something called the sword policy and it restricted the import of recyclables, particularly plastic and paper bales. And it, 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 it caused a big disruption in the marketplace. Half of the recyclables that were generated worldwide were being sent to China and China basically said enough is enough. They had some environmental concerns, workplace safety concerns. They didn't wanna be a dumping ground uh, for other countries. So they they restricted the import by putting some really low contamination standards. Um, 
but actually it might be a blessing in disguise. Uh, local governments and recycling processes are had to scramble to find new markets. Now, unfortunately, some local governments um, shut down their recycling services or they stopped taking certain items as, as a result of this. But I think in the long run, it's probably a good thing to create more markets locally uh, for recyclables uh, rather than trying to send it overseas. There was also a natural gas fracking boom uh, that, that's taken place. Um, and it's opened up a market for hydrocarbon ethane um, that can be made into plastic. And so it, it's mean that you can, uh, a lot of this is for flexible packaging. And it means that uh, it's harder for recycled content material to compete because it's, it's become less expensive to, to, to make uh, virgin plastics. And a lot of that's due to the natural gas fracking boom that we saw, that we've seen in the last five, seven, eight years. There's been an increase in the use of single use materials during the COVID pandemic. I'm doing it. I know everybody, it's a struggle. Um, and we've had to make some trade-offs. Uh, it's been a tough, tough two years. Um, I know there's a lot of fatigue out there. Um, so that's also impacted uh, uh, recycling in kind of in a negative way. Uh, but there's some pluses out there. It, not all the recent developments are negative. There are some pluses. We've seen the consumer goods com companies commit to using recyc more recycled content for packaging. Unilever, um, Coca-Cola, Nestle, and, and others have stepped up and said, we're going to try to incorporate 25% recycled content into our packaging uh, by 2025. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is, is they're at, a, at about 2% right now. So it's gonna be a challenge for them to, to meet those commitments. We've seen, I, I'm reading more and more about improved separation and sorting technologies for material recovery facilities, kind of robotic, AI, better optic, you know, op, newer optical sensors. I don't completely understand it, but I, I have been seeing more and more articles about um, improved technologies that are, that are being implemented. Uh, in the private sector. And we, you know, after the China put their import restriction in place, we did, you know, it was tough in 2019 and 2020, but notice that recycling rebounded in 2021 and uh, the, uh, the markets did to some extent and, and uh, US paper mills upgraded some of their processing technology higher demand for cardboard boxes, cardboard to make new boxes. I think we know in part what, what's driving that. And then the plastic scrap prices have inched up uh, a little bit. So that's, that's some good news out there. Uh, I wanna talk about plastics and climate change um, because when we, you know, we have to think broadly about plastics because, because carbon or greenhouse gases are uh, generated in each step, at each st uh, stage of the plastic life cycle. And um, we, we need to also keep in mind that not, you know, 98, 99% of the plastics are produced from chemicals that are sourced from fossil fuels. And the plastic industry currently accounts for about 6% of the global oil consumption. That's expected to reach 20% by 2050. So, we are beginning to obviously to see the energy and the transportation transportation sectors decarbonize, and, and so what's happening is that the oil and gas producers are pivoting. They they see that plastics will be a good bet for growing. So there's a lot of plans to build new uh, uh, petrochemical plants, new more plastic manufacturing facilities, um, and um, and in part, it's because I think the oil and gas producers see this as, as a way to compensate for the decarbonization that's going in different, happening in different sectors of the economy. Um, plastic, as I mentioned earlier, plastic produces greenhouse gas emissions at every stage of the life cycle from extraction to manufacturing to disposal. And there was an interesting report that was issued um, late last year by Beyond Plastics. It's a nonprofit organization. And they, they did a pretty good 
research of, of the plastics industry and their plans for expansion. And, and they, you know, the report found that the plastic industry's contribution to climate change is on track to exceed that of coal-fired power in this country by 2030. That's astounding. Um, and so plastics could become a new coal. And it's something we need to stay focused on. So I think the point I'm trying to make with all this, these, these various charts and graphs and so on is, is that recycling alone is, is not enough. We're consuming way too many resources. The recycling industry can't keep up literally. And it, we, it's time for a system redesign. And so um, we need to be thinking about shifting that focus from waste management to resource opportunity. Uh, we got to get beyond recycling. We got to put more emphasis on ways to prevent waste from being created in the first place. And we've got to engage more players than local governments traditionally responsible for waste management. They yeah. got to get the private, especially the private sector. They have a role to play. In, in dealing with the uh, um, amount of waste and resources that we're, waste we're generating, resources we're consuming. Zero waste, it's a, it's, it's a concept that's been around now since the 90s. In fact, I think it, it goes back further to the 60s and 80s, cradle to grave thinking, uh, total recycling uh, concepts, um, pollution prevention. Uh, but it's something that's kind of crystallized in the last um, 20 years, this concept of zero waste. And it's really picked up in the 1990s uh, in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, and that's kind of been a, 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 where it, this concept has been nurtured, but now it's spreading across the globe. And the, the whole idea with zero waste is to push economies toward the target of sending as little waste as possible to landfills, incinerators, and the environment. and there are several components to zero waste. The one is responsible production or methods that will do a better job of conserving resources uh, and limiting pollution, uh, changing our mindset from wasting materials to managing resources as an asset, to view those materials as, as a valuable asset, not as a problem that we got to figure out how to dispose or try to figure out how to recycle. We've got, we, I mentioned that linear production system early on, we've got to redesign it uh, into closed loop systems. And we've got to design waste, we got to think, get on top of this problem very early on in, in the production system. We've got to begin looking at designing waste out of products and we've got to rethink product delivery systems. Uh, we've got to think circular, keeping materials in use for as long as possible. And then we've got to find ways where, where reuse, recycling, repair, composting can benefit the local economy and help create more resilient communities. So there's a social connection here. This, this is the zero waste hierarchy on the right that was adopted by the um, Zero Waste International Association. Um, and you'll see it, it's, it, it follows a progression of policies and strategies and that those first three elements are really designed to try to eliminate waste rather than deal with it. They are now, uh, recycling and composting is now lower on the list of priorities. Um, one thing to keep in mind with zero waste, it doesn't mean getting to absolute zero. I think zero waste is a journey. It's gonna be a journey for businesses. It's gonna be a journey for communities and, and, for, and for consumers. So, um, it, it doesn't, you know, our zero waste efforts are going to vary um, uh, across the country, but, but so, but it is a, it's not a destination, it's really a journey. What zero waste is it? And I think this is kind of important because there's been some greenwashing going on out there. Um, um, the first thing to realize is that it's not recycling, composting 100% of what we use. Uh, there are definitely, you know, paper bags are a good example of they're recyclable, but they do generate re resource, require resources, energy to create and to recycle. So using a, a reusable bag is preferred and um, 
and has a greater um, uh, impacts, uh, greater ability to reduce environmental impacts. Um, I also want to point out that zero waste does not include waste energy technologies like combustion or pyrolysis or gasification. Um, more energy can be saved and global warming impacts decrease by reducing waste, reusing products, recycling, and composting that can be produced from burning discards. Um, Low-grade plastic has been a fuel, key fuel in many waste energy plants and uh, there are some proposals for plastic to fuel plants that are popping up around the country. And again, the lower grade plastics, the four through sevens will be, uh, are, are, are what's being targeted. But the thing you got to remember about plastics, again, it's a petroleum based product. And when combusted for, ener combusted for energy, it functions as a fossil fuel. Uh, from a climate perspective, when you think about, uh, waste reduction, recycling, and, and waste energy. Recycling means getting those carbon molecules into new products, not combusting them to raise the CO concentrations in our atmosphere. And the waste energy facilities move us farther away, not closer to a circular economy where all resources can be res resumed fully back into the system. Waste energy facilities destroy resources. It's kind of a one and done technology. Their um, communities have adopted a way to measure zero waste progress. Um, and, um, uh, you know, again, uh, you, you can, the Zero Waste International Association has designated communities and businesses that divert 90% or more of their waste from landfills and centers and environment as zero waste uh, entities. Um, and I typically, how the communities calculate that the diversion rate for zero waste is they'll, they'll take recycling and compost and then divide that by recycling compost and landfill. And interestingly, zero waste percentages will vary by community based on what they count. You know, some communities are looking just at residential commercial rate or waste. Others will, in addition to residential and commercial, will include some of the special waste like construction and demolition debris, uh, wood waste, biosolids, and so on. Again, when you think about this whole question of dealing with our waste, it's not just the responsibility of a local government. There is a role for everyone, and that starts with the private sector, with the private sector proactively shifting away from throwaway packaging to reuse and, to, and helping to develop methods to collect and recycle materials. We have to take more personal responsibility at the back end of the problem for what uh, we buy, consume, and discard. And then finally, government's role is bringing uh, the community and the producers uh, together through planning policies and, and also education. So there's, a, there's still a big role for government. What can government do? And I've, you know, I've looked at zero waste plans that have been developed in other communities like Austin, San Francisco, and uh, Fort Collins, and Albuquerque and um, uh, numerous communities in California. And, and, and I've sort of identified some of the key things that uh, local governments are doing. And they're, they're first established a zero waste benchmark, you know, and timelines, you know, reduce, divert 35% of the waste away from the landfill, uh, and then move that up to 50% then 70%. So they have kind of a tiered approach to um, uh, that they'll try to accomplish over a, you know, a 10, 20, 25 year period. Um, just want to point out that the, uh, the cl climate emergency that was, was uh, declared by the city mayor and the city council back in 2020 includes a zero waste goal, 50% um, diversion goal by 2030 and then zero waste by 2015. Um, what communities, I think I've noticed the communities have really conducted a lot of outreach and, 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 and gotten stakeholders involved in both in designing and implementing zero waste programs. So they've created uh, advisory committees that have been involved from the get go. And so it's, it's, it's important to have broad public involvement when you're developing a zero waste plan. 
they're partnering uh, with nonprofits and businesses and others to, to publicize uh, or promote low impact living through publicity campaigns and outreach and education. They're working to expand opportunities for the reuse, repair, and uh, businesses and organizations as well. And they're, they're working to grow the collection and processing infrastructure for composting. A lot of communities that have adopted zero waste strategies have three stream collection systems, curbside collection systems, as well as some uh, drop-offs for uh, composting. Um, they've developed ordinances to restrict uh, the use of unnecessary single-use packaging. Uh, they've, they've created um, some funding for to support circular economy and green business startups at the local level. Uh, and they have recognition programs where they're, they're every year annually, they're pointing out who some of the zero waste early adopters and innovators are in the community. Um, at the state level, we're beginning to see uh, states work to hold producers more responsible for product waste. Uh, they're establishing take back requirements for hard to recycle items like carpeting and mattresses and paint and uh, unused drugs. Um, they're also asking those producers to provide financial support for material recovery infrastructure. They're setting recycled content standards for new products and packaging. Um, so there's a, there's a role for state government uh, to play and there's some good things happening. Uh, where, where state government is taking the lead. Here's an example of a zero waste community at San Francisco. It was one of the first communities to go zero waste. They set their zero waste by 2020 goal um, back in 2003. They haven't met their goal. I think they're around 60% diversion. Uh, they're still working on it and they'll probably start updating their plans. But some of the key things they did was they implemented the three stream citywide residential commercial curbside collection program. They adopted building space standards for recycling and compost handling systems. They've established uh, construction demolition debris recovery requirements for municipal products. They've, they've set some restrictions on non-recyclable and single use packaging, um, also takeout containers um, and they're promoting use of, of uh, compostable plastic recycled paper or reusable checkout bags at supermarkets and drugstores. We'll talk a little bit about more about compostable plastic in a minute. And then they're working. I think a role that the city government should take is to, to advocate to the, our state lawmakers and federal lawmakers that they need to get more involved in passing uh, laws that are going to promote the use of recycled content material in products and packaging. Another case study from Boulder. What I thought was interesting about Boulder, Boulder is they approved a trash tax, probably a fee on the amount of garbage generated. Um, and that's money is being used to support innovative waste reduction, zero waste practices. They did something very similar to San Francisco. They expanded recycling composting to all residents, businesses, and they also do it at special events. Um, and so it, 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 it tells me that, that there's a real commitment there. Uh, and again, it's a journey. Uh, there's some other examples here of, of other cities and what they're doing to um, implement their zero waste plans. I wanna talk about extended producer responsibility. I've touched on it, but the whole concept here is to hold product manufacturers, the consumer goods companies accountable and financially responsible for the waste created by their businesses and, and their, the key components are putting the responsibility on, on, the, on the manufacturers to design greener, safer products that are less wasteful, more durable, repairable, and reusable. Um, having those uh, product manufacturers take responsibility for establishing and or funding recycling programs. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, creating take back programs for hard to recycle products. And last year, there were a couple of interesting extended producer responsibility laws that passed that focused on packaging. Um, one law passed in Maine, the other in Oregon. <clears throat> Both of these states have been leaders on zero waste traditionally. Uh, they cover single-use plastics, paper, packaging materials, and food serviceware. 
and the producers pay a fee to the state based on packaging that they sell on consumers. And those fees go to a, a third party entity, a stewardship organization that will manage and help develop methods to collect and recycle the covered products. And towns are, are gonna get compensated for health uh, managing the materials created by the producers. Towns that have existing infrastructure will get some financial assistance. So it'll be interesting to see how these, these bills um, evolve or the, these programs evolve over time. I'm sure there'll be some glitches, but it's, um, I'm hoping to see more of these laws passed um, in the next two to three years. I wanna give some examples of brands that are exploring reusable, refillable packaging options. Uh, and this is important because um, we really have to think differently. It's, it's, it's not just, again, about recycling, uh, but it's actually trying to reduce cons um, conserve resources, change our waste generating habits by coming up with some new product delivery systems. So I've got a, you know, several examples uh, some of these, these programs are being implemented in South America and Mexico and over in Europe and India, uh, as well as here. Uh, but um, a couple of small companies, startups are selling cleaning products uh, can, uh, in the form of tablets that can be dropped in reusable glass bottles. Um, I use one here at home for both uh, uh, our dishwashing detergent and a and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, hand sanitation. They're, they're, they're pretty, pretty nifty systems. Uh, Nestle's testing a refill stations and stores for coffee and pet food. <clears throat> uh, McDonald's is testing a reusable coffee cup. Uh, they can be dropped in a bin for cleaning. Burger King is testing a reusable Whopper container. Dove has introduced a refillable steel deodorant. Uh, and, the, and one I really want to touch on here, um, and that we, we're, we're looking at closely, um, our working group is that San Francisco has a startup company that's piloting reusable container delivery service for takeout food. Um, the burden, the nifty thing about this program is that the restaurants who participate in the program, they don't have to take back the containers and they don't have to wash the containers. That's being done by um, a, a third party and, um, and they're a drop off uh, uh, containers or system uh, drop off bins that have been placed around the city. Uh, similar programs have been rolled out of uh, uh, Boulder, uh, a couple of other cities. Uh, we've developed, uh, our working groups developed a reusable container survey that we're going to start uh, promoting to the restaurant industry to here in Tucson to gauge its interest in uh, using reusable containers for uh, takeout meals. And again, what about bio-based plastics? I talked, you know, composting, compostable plastics. Should they be considered? I think we have to be cautious. Um, bio-based plastic that's made from, you know, corn or sugar cane, it's still often disposable or single use. Um, it may contain chemical additives. The bio-based pl plastics don't, just like regular plastic, they don't fully disappear and stick break. In, apart into smaller fragments, including microplastics. Compostable plastics, interesting. Uh, it's engineered to de decompose under certain conditions. The problem is, is that you, <clears throat> for compostable plastics to really take off, you, you'd have to have a, an industrial size composting system in your community. And most communities don't have that. Uh, so they're not, those compostable plastic items aren't getting composted. Um, so we have to be cautious uh, with some of these uh, uh, newer alternatives that are, that are popping up and uh, look at them um, very carefully. I want to just touch on food and organic waste. It's, it's going to be really critical, I think, and I think it's going to have to be a key component of our local zero waste plan here in Tucson. Um, Globally, about a third of the food produced for human consumption is lost or wasted. That amounts to about 1.3 billion tons every year. And most wasted food ends up in landfills. And the problem is, is that when it's in a landfill and it's decaying, uh, it's generating methane. And it's a greenhouse gas that is much more powerful and potent than, than carbon dioxide. 
Um, and so it's, it's, it behooves us to try to divert food waste from our local landfill uh, as well as capture that with that methane emissions uh, from the facility that are currently being generated. Um, and then the thing again, again, you got to think upstream. When you food goes uneaten, the resources that were used to produce it all have a significant environmental footprint. Uh, so you've got to really take a systems approach when we look at uh, the problems with food waste. Uh, and I've listed some key sources of food waste. I don't necessarily need to have to go into them, but but uh, that have been identified. And, and and it's good, you know, again, finding out, you know, figuring out what the problem is and then looking at ways to try to address some of these, these food waste uh, sources that, that we'll, we see at the uh, at the local and state level. I want to mention, uh, talk now about the city of Tucson. Uh, uh, it, 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 um, the uh, Tucson Environmental and General Services wants to develop a uh, zero waste plan for the community. Uh, and back in July of 2021, uh, they announced that they wanted their intention to develop a uh, a zero waste plan, and and they complemented that with a proposal to convert the Los Reales landfill into a sustainability campus uh, that would house recycling businesses, um, construction demolition debris, more composting, um, waste to energy. Unfortunately, is part of the the initial plan, uh, but it has some interesting. Uh, sustainability components to it. It would include a uh, a um, solar uh, generating system. It would include a tree nursery, walking paths. So uh, I, I I give a lot of credit to TEGS for thinking creatively. Um, in September, they presented their roadmap for developing a zero waste plan for the community that was adopted by the city council. Like in the green light to move forward with it. Um, it's a seven or eight step program. Um, they indicated though, that they wanted to implement some low hanging fruit projects at the sustainability campus before completing the plan. And they wanna make move forward uh, before they do their stakeholder involvement, they wanna move forward in evaluating some downstream waste management processing technologies. And uh, that would include waste energy and mixed waste processing. Um, composting, construction, debris, recovery, and, and so on. Um, and um, that's kind of the first few steps in their plan is to start looking at some downstream waste management technologies. Uh, we gave both the mayor's office and TEGS some recommendations um, uh, for developing a zero waste plan. We, we again urged that they create a broad stakeholder group Get, get the waste haulers involved, get the compost operators, the recycling businesses, the repair reuse organizations involved, get the commercial building managers and, and uh, um, business districts and, and uh, community groups involved in that process very, very early on. In fact, ask for input on how to design the process. And we, we suggested rather than develop you know, start looking first at downstream waste management processing technologies, get the zero waste visioning process up and going. Uh, under the current roadmap, that's gonna come later. And uh, we need to, as a community, decide what will our zero waste hierarchy involve? What will be our zero waste goals? What are gonna be the objectives of our plan? Those are things I think that need to be uh, established early to help us prioritize what kind of, um, strategies, diversion strategies we're going to consider here. We've we suggested that they, the city conduct a waste characterization study, hasn't been done in a while, uh, looking at the types of and quantities of materials that are being disposed of in the landfill. Um, we, we suggested that they put more emphasis on evaluating upstream waste reduction strategies like reuse and repair and sharing and um, those are, those are areas that tend to get neglected. Uh, we recommended that they exclude waste energy and plastic fuel systems from the plan. 
And um, we also recommended that they avoid making mixed waste processing where you co-mingle um, in one bin, you would co-mingle your, your recyclables and your trash and then send it to a mixed waste processing facility, sometimes known as a dirty MRF. Uh, we've recommended don't, you know, don't make that the backbone of the plan. And then we suggest that they, they play, place significant focus on food waste reduction and, and collection of organic waste. We've, our working group, our zero waste working group has created, uh, wants to create some subcommittees. Um, so I wanna extend an invitation to all of you, uh, or if you wanna participate on one of our subcommittees, we wanna look at low impact living and how we can promote, and educate people. Uh, we want to look at uh, product extension strategy, strategies like repair, reuse, and sharing. Make sure that's a high priority for the plan, zero waste plan. Want to uh, continue to work on reusable containers for takeout meals and try to partner up with restaurants and the business community. Uh, we want to take that hard look at food waste reduction, universal re recycling requirement where uh, recycling would be made available to multifamily dwellings in, commercial, in the commercial sector. We, we want to investigate three stream, stream collection systems where you have a, not two carts, but three carts, one for the organic waste. And we're going to want to keep an eye on what's going on in California because the law was just went into effect on January 1st. It requires communities uh, to divert organic waste. Um, uh, from the land from landfills and many are starting to look at these three stream collection systems and so I want to really take a careful look at what the desert communities and like Palm Springs are doing uh, to comply with the, the state law and then we want to look at biological treatment of organic waste kind of things like composting anaerobic digestion uh, mechanical biological treatment of residuals before they're landfilled um, so I'd like, again, if you're interested in participating on one of these subcommittees or if you have an idea you'd like to share with us that you think we should be exploring and promoting as the city develops its zero waste plan, please contact me. I, I put the email there at the, on the right side, my email on the right side of the, um, the slide. And that's it. And I'd be interested in taking any questions. I'd, Certainly like to get some feedback from folks and any comments that you want to offer. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Kevin. This is, um, I think we might have a master's degree if we can uh, remember and recall all the information that you put out there. It's an incredible treasure trove. You showed us uh, pictures of the, the growing nature of waste production. You contrasted for us clearly past and present patterns of usage showing us a steeply growing amount of waste that we're creating as a people. And it was interesting to see the different proportions of different kinds of waste in the municipal waste stream. I'm not sure we all knew that paper and paperboard were, were the biggest amount weight-wise. I'm not sure we all knew how much food waste is adding to the problem. You point out the liabilities of plastic, which is a growing part of our waste stream. And uh, you, you reminded us the new zero waste hierarchy with this big emphasis on the top with rethinking, redesigning, and then reducing, and then reusing. I think we all appreciate your acknowledgement of the creativity in this draft zero waste plan developed by Tucson Environmental uh, Services and you, you made a very clear, rational work plan that would fill in some of the gaps in their effort. I'm hoping that um, people here tonight would like to join in your work on promoting that plan. The first question we have is from Charles Jeffrey on, what is needed to bring composting to municipal scale? I think we're gonna have to look at um... Well, I, I, I'm a big believer in, in not having to recreate the way it, uh, uh, what's working out there, basically. I, I tend to, uh, I would start at looking at what other, what's happening in other zero waste communities. Uh, 
how did they, what systems did they put in place for collecting food waste and other organics? Um, where are those materials going? Uh, some communities are developing compo large scale composting facilities. Uh, some are, are building anaerobic digesters. Um, um, others are also looking at creating neighborhood based uh, composting sites where you can bring your, your materials. And, and I found a group in Palm Springs called the Desert Composters. They've created these little composting, trying to create these composting hubs. Um, so I think, you know, the first step is, is I, I don't want to recreate the wheel, but I think it's looking at what other communities are doing. With composting, you got to look at the desert communities in California because of that new state law and see what they're identifying as potential strategies, and then build, build partnerships, build relationships with organizations, whether it's community garden groups, uh, there's um, Tucson Clean and Beautiful, um, uh, neighborhood groups, you know, pull, a, pull a, um, uh, a group of people together to do some brainstorming and look at some options um, and uh, in, a, in a kind of facilitated structure, structured way. Um, and, I, and again, one thing I, I'm going to really want to uh, point out, one big issue is it's going to take funding. And that's why I think it's going to be important to look for uh, the producers uh, helping to um, um, fund projects and programs, uh, foundations, and others, because you know, this it's not like the city's got a big bag of money to, to open up a compost, you know, composting facility or anaerobic digester or set up some community based systems. It's going to have to be a, a partnership, we have to think creatively on how to fund something like that. Okay, well, thank you, Kevin. And here's a couple of quick call outs, by the way. <clears throat> Patricia Dow reminds us for those who haven't gone, Govinda's offers only two bins for their diners waste. One is composting and one is recycling. Makes me think of a Montessori school in Oakland, California, where after they heard a presentation on plastics and plastic pollution, they, they made a policy that uh, school-wide that whatever kids brought to school for lunch, they had to take home with them if they didn't eat it. So that could be an apple core. Act, no, actually they, they captured the compostables there, but anything else, any landfill bound trash had to go home with the children. And you go in there, uh, these primary classrooms and you see all these lunch kits with little compartments and those parents had gotten stuff that really minimized the waste. And another call out from- Actually, let me interrupt you real quick, Stuart. I do want to mention that uh, TEGS has, has ro rolled out a plan, I think last year where they are picking up food waste and other organics from restaurants and in institutional Facilities. And I'm not sure how many they have signed up, uh, uh, but I, I know they've been out there promoting it. And then the, the, the materials are taken to the composting facility uh, at the at, at the Los Reales landfill for processing. Okay. So Trace had a question for you, Kevin. What is TEGS doing to identify? The kinds of businesses or even specific businesses that they can make useful things from recycled materials? Uh, TG, TEGS plans to uh, issue an RFI request for information to uh, get proposals from the um, from businesses on, on reuse businesses and recycling businesses that, that could make use of. Um, recyclables and so on. So they they do have a a and that's an element of their in their or a step in their zero waste plan. So they they want to find out what's possible out there and what businesses might be interested in setting up shop. I I think that that's a good thing, um, but I I really think what we need to do as well is to figure out what do we have already in place. Uh, where, uh, what type of recycling and reuse businesses do we have in the community? Where are they located? How do they operate? Uh, what are their future plans? Uh, what are some of the challenges they're facing? Uh, we've got to lay that out uh, 
very early on in the, in the zero waste planning process because you know there may be opportunities to build on what we already have and 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 we have to make some decisions about what type of facilities you want to house down at the sustainability campus and 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 what kind of facilities you might want to have you know in the uh, business districts or the in, uh, uh, industrial districts in, in a city and so on and so i think the first thing is to do a, a complete inventory of what what's out there already in the community okay so nick i don't know how to pronounce your last name nick but nick has asked what can we do as a community to combat the state's preemption of municipal and county regulation of single-use plastics and, and ben is nodding his head knowingly We've, we know what happened to Bisbee. Um, I came from a state where there was no such preemption and we, we had cities and counties up and down the state adopting plastics reduction ordinances and finally the state did a couple of things. So Kevin. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, um, you know, the, um, probably the, the most effective thing we can do is try to find like-minded groups uh, throughout the state and develop a campaign to try to convince our legislators and senators uh, that uh, the preemption law needs to be overturned. Local government should have the right to make decisions locally on whether or not a, uh, a phase out or a tax would be appropriate for certain um, single use items. Um, and that would mean, you know, working with groups in Phoenix or Flagstaff or uh, certainly Bisbee, because that's where the, uh, the, the first ordinance was passed. But trying to find, again, like-minded groups to try to build a campaign, begin lobbying our legislators to be proactive and, and, and working for trying to get legislators to, you know, when the election's coming up, you know, try to make it an issue in, in the local election, and at least get the issue out in front of some of the legislators and see if you can get, them. sometimes legislators will make commitments um, or, or candidates, political candidates will make commitments before they, and mm -hmm. so um, it, it means building a coalition, building a campaign. Well, Hi, I'd, like, I, I'd like to say something about that. Um, so I just recently went to, um, um, the Dems had um, Diego Rodriguez for attorney general. And so I asked him that question. Um, and he, and being somebody who has been a lawyer, he has some expertise on what to do about situations like that. And he had actually um, suggested that the city can actually sue the, the manufacturer, the people who produce the plastic for like, for instance, zero, um, the, the plastic bags that are getting caught in the recycling machine, that if there are some stats on how much that costs the city, um, that the city could actually sue the companies for the cost of those plastic bags being stuck in the machine and any other count, clean cleanup costs and stuff like that. And I will put his contact information in the chat. Thank you, Jana. Yeah, that's interesting. So Diego Rodriguez. Okay, well, let's see, we've got. Um... Yeah, he was actually really um, into a lot of sustainability stuff. And he said, as somebody who's been a lawyer, he knows how to work around these things. Okay. Kevin, would you like to tell us anything about the Repair Cafe? How does that fit into the big picture of waste reduction? How does what fit in? I'm sorry. The Repair Cafe? Yeah, I, sh I should mention a project that's being led by uh, Rocky Bear and Stephen Menke. Uh, Rocky's on, see she's present. Um, she and Stephen have, uh, have created a nonprofit and they're hosting uh, repair events. Uh, they've been doing it at Zero Craft. Um, they've had three or four events there uh, once a month. They're occurring and um, they're they're interesting because it's not a place where you you necessarily bring your broken item whether it's furniture or an appliance or electronics to get fixed you bring it but you're also involved 
<laughs> in, in learning how to fix it. Um, you know, it's a skill that we've all lost to a large extent, how to fix stuff. Um, you know, we, well, if something breaks, I throw it in the garbage cart and then I go buy a new thing. And uh, so it's an interesting concept and, and there are volunteers, repair people who are volunteering to help teach people how to, how to fix a particular item. Um, I, sh you know, Rocky helped me out, but I know she, or the next event's gonna probably be held close to the University of Arizona campus to go host during the daytime and reach out to students to try to get some interest on their part. So it's something that we'd like to figure out how to fund. Uh, we need a permanent space. Uh, we've been borrowing space at Zero Craft, which is located downtown. There are a, um, Why don't we see if Rocky would like to comment just for a minute? Yeah. Okay, next event is February 12th. Um, anything else you'd like to put into the room tonight, Rocky, on this? Let me just talk because it's taking it's taking a long time to text. So um, yeah, so we're every there's a event every second Saturday of the month. Um, so we just had our event on the eighth, and then we're we're going to have another one on the twelfth. Um, I stay tuned for the time, um, just because I think. Um, we might do something different out for the time again, um, but we're also trying to figure out if we can host another event at a different location other than Zero Craft, uh, just because, uh, you know, it's downtown, it's a lot of construction, it's hard for people to get there, so we're trying to host an event with um, a church uh, on campus, uh, so we are going to see about that. So, right, thanks. Well Thank you, Rocky, for all the energy and, and vision that, that goes into this. Let's try asking those questions I put out at the beginning for those who were here at that time. You will be invited to answer the question and you may pass, but I'll just, I'm going alphabetically by the names on the list. So if you don't respond within 10 seconds, I'll figure that you, you're passing, but you can just say pass if you don't wish to answer right away. Um, Stuart, can you put that list on there again? If somebody came late, like I did, um, we don't have access to the questions that were listed. Okay, list. here we go. Good idea. First question is, what policy would you most like to see implemented in Tucson to reduce our waste? Kevin has, of course, given us um, a lot of ideas about that. <clears throat> so here, here comes the question. And let's start with just going alphabetically. Looks like Barb isn't here anymore. Oh no, we're here. Oh good, Barb. Well, what do you say? <laughs> um, I think probably the three stream waste, like um, you know, they're doing in the Northwest. We we were in Seattle when they were doing that, and um, we just felt like it was pretty great to be able to get to do it all. You know, so that's what I'd say. Super. Thank you for being clear and concise to our Ben. What would you most like to see us work on as a city? And we'll have to. Sorry, you'll have to unmute. Okay. Um, you know, the the whole business of the plastic bags, the single use plastic bags, really hits home with me. Uh, you noted uh, that the as the transportation industry, which is something I. I watch and, and, and happy to see become more electrified and such that the, the fossil fuel companies are going to increasingly, uh, you know, the single use plastic, uh, the plastic bag thing and, and the frustration that, uh, that we have uh, with the state basically mandating that uh, municipalities can't uh, pass laws uh, against uh, uh, limiting their use. Um, complex topic, but that's, that's a big one with me. Okay, super. And Dan Stormont, what, what would you like? Going to put me on the spot, aren't you, Stuart? Yes, um, but you can pass if you'd like. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, I, I actually, very similar to what uh, some others have said, I think one of the like easier lifts is just for us to encourage, especially local businesses, to not use plastic packaging, especially in this time when a lot of us have been doing takeout and ending up with all these styrofoam packages and 
generally non-recyclable plastic packages. Anything that's not a one or two isn't recyclable. And honestly, the ones and twos aren't all that recyclable either. So um, I think it's it's kind of a two-pronged thing. One is, of course, talking to the businesses when you go there and encouraging them to use something other than plastic. And the other would be to get the word out about the restaurants that do use cardboard, for example, or compostable packaging. Like, you know, I can think of a couple offhand. Uh, Zana's is one that comes to mind immediately, but there are others as well. So definitely encouraging that when we see it and also trying to work with them. And I know at one point, I don't know, maybe Kevin could give an update on this. I know he and Sharia at one point were working with the uh, Fourth Avenue merchants trying to get them to adopt paper packaging. And there's a lot of issues involved with that. But I think that's one of the easy things we can do. But really when it, what it comes down to, and this is where it's hard for us to do something locally, is really pushing to not get all this single use packaging. And of course, the reason we're getting all of that is because oil companies need to sell their oil somewhere and they're switching from burning it in through our tailpipes to making disposable plastic packaging with it. So it's really a difficult economic thing because they're making bank on all this throwaway plastic. So I don't, you know, that's that's a bigger problem than we can solve. Hmm. I, I, I should mention, Dan, that um, Sharia thought it would be best to sort of back burner the project with uh, uh, Fourth Avenue Historic District uh, folks because of the pandemic. And uh, and it's something I think we want to kind of circle back to at some point, hopefully in, hopefully in the not too distant future. Well, let's keep rolling. We've got a few minutes left and love to hear it. Dana, would you like to put something in the room? Uh, yeah, I was I was just surprised about the lack of returning on the bottles and, and those packaging that only 50% made it back. And I know I've lived in a state where there's deposits, mm. the same where they've instigated, to, you know, having to buy the bags. And I'm surprised. I, I know people may be negative. They don't want to pay more. It's always get the cheapest thing. But the reality is the states I, I've lived in where they do that, if you're not recycling, anybody that's on the street is going to pick up any of those, anything that's out there it seems like gets picked up when there's a deposit on it. Um, the other thing is at some point, there's gonna to have to be some type of tax credit or some incentive for businesses to develop or do these products. Um, I don't know how that would work, but I think at some point, you know, there's enough businesses that are suffering right now with funds. So there may be grants or some way to approach this to try to get them involved financially with some type of backing. Um, and that's about it. Very, just so much information, so yeah. much information. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Danny, for both of those ideas, the bottle bill and the, some kind of financial support for businesses taking zero waste efforts. Uh, is Donna here still? Let me just check. Donna, your iPad is here. Do you have anything you'd like to say? We'll assume that she's getting the tea off the stove. We'll give her a chance later. Uh, how about Donye? You can see I'm going up the alphabet by first letter. So I uh, know your time is coming. Donye. Um, I'm thinking a lot about the, um, I'm sorry, disposable containers for takeout food. And I'm, I'm not sure if um, that's what... Um, Kevin was just talking about the project. I, I kind of zoned out for a second there, but um, I that's something I think that could make a huge impact. And I and I agree with other things that people have said already as well. Okay, thank you, Donye. Dwayne, I was just uh, I don't know if it's a policy, <clears throat> but conversations and suggestion and whatever of the idea of uh, buying fresh food, which you can bring your own bags to put them in at the store and using that, <laughs> eat more plants. Uh, you can buy that stuff pretty much without packaging, uh, except for the skin on it. And often you can eat that. So uh, that's, my, that's my idea. Mm. All right, a personal lifestyle choice that if enough people adopted it, it would have 
uh, a rippling effect. Edward, are you here still? Let's see. Yes, Edward's iPhone is here. <clears throat> Edward, we'll circle back to you in case you've thought of something. Um, let's, and Jana, you, you made a, a comment about those um, wonderful cups that are being advertised but maybe there's something bigger that you'd like to talk about it as the most important thing we can work on. Yeah, actually, um, I'm always about, um, I think they should have separate containers for compost to pick up at everybody's houses. Um, and generally, um, I, I think we need to have better recycling that they, the way that we dump everything in the recycling bins that, a lot of people don't even believe it's being recycled, but human beings are going through that trash and have, you know, people put dirty diapers in there and everything and dog poop. And um, and so I think if we had separate containers for the recycling that people would be able to, you know, at least believe that it is being recycled. But I, I really think, you know, we need we need a whole change in the way we look at things and do a lot of you know, less, less, we, recycling is not enough. Like um, Kevin said, we really need to do zero waste and, you know, just change our whole way of, you know, thinking and encourage the grocery stores too, to have less, you know, you know, go in the grocery store and ask for things that aren't in plastic containers, you know, and start making a noise about it. Keep asking. <clears throat> All right, and uh, Jan. Chan Schumann, what would you most like Tucson to do to make a big impact? Jan, I think, is um, in the Tai Chi studio momentarily. And when she's back, let's ask again. Uh, Joe, Joe Sillins. Yeah, hey, Stuart, thanks. Um, you bet. I, and, and thanks, Kevin, for an excellent presentation. I think um, for me, a policy that I would like to see would be uh, kind of a larger composting pro program at the, the city level or, you know, maybe neighborhood level that the city could support and promote. And, um, you know, people can kind of see the connection between uh, decay and decomposition and growth. And, you know, it might not be, um, you know, a whole citywide collection program, but maybe partnering with some like neighborhood hubs where people are growing things and, and composting so people can kind of see that that connection um, would be something that I would be interested in seeing. Interesting, a demonstration project. Um, Joyce, you had a question that you put in the chat. Do you have a, a comment about that or about an, an even higher priority policy you'd like to see? <clears throat> okay. Uh, Joyce's question was, can the city charge a tax on businesses that use plastics or could it offer credit for those who don't? So that, that was an interesting policy question that Joyce would be curious about. And Margot Garcia, would you like to offer something? Is Margot still here? I think Margot just left. Oh, there you are. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> I second the plastic bags. I would like to see, I uh, serve on the Environmental Services Advisory Committee, and I would like to see us take a plunge and ask our city uh, lobbyists to start talking about um, getting rid of the plastic bag ban and actually trying to put it in place. That's something I've worked on for a long time. Uh, the composting we're doing at the city, we, it took a long time to get all the permits in place to uh, be able to compost. We are collecting it from a number of restaurants and stores. And uh, so it's quite an experiment. It's not as easy to compost materials in a desert environment as it is in lots of other places. So we're learning as we're going and we still don't have an end product, again, like recycling. You want to have a product at the end that you can sell or make useful. You don't want to just get um, bigger and bigger heaps of uh, decayed material. 
And so the product still is not up to the standard that uh, we feel it should be. So um, it's being worked on and there's a lot of discussion of a green waste barrel, which you would put things in, they would be chipped and composted or um, lots of different versions of that. There probably would be additional fee for that. At least that's the thinking at this time. Thank you, you so know, much. Thinking Robert. about composting and you bring up a good point. Uh, we are a desert community. Um, you know, you know, the city provides uh, recycling collection what, twice a month. And I think, I, you know, I think one thing we'd have to look into is if you set up a, if you had a third cart, uh, a, a organic or green waste cart, call it whatever you want, but that may be something that has to be picked, collected. The right. material has to be collected, you know, once a week. And, and obviously that would impose and, and a, some additional burdens. Uh, on the city's waste management pro program. It's, it will cost some additional um, um, money. And, and, and the question for the politicians is they never like to raise fees or taxes. And uh, so we have to kind of figure out, you know, the best way, if, if that's the right way to go, uh, you know, and I do like three stream collection systems, you, to figure out, how, you know, what's the best way to fund it? And how do you build community support for, doing something like that. Okay, I'm watching the clock, you know, we're running down to the end. So what we'll do is get suggestions from the last few people. And then if there's a minute left, we can uh, see if anyone would like to, to make a pitch on one of the ideas and say why they think it's the most important. Um, not as much time as we'd like, but Nick, go ahead if you've got something. Um, sure, yeah. I I think my mind goes back to food waste uh, pretty readily. So one thing um, that might be possible is trying to divert some of that food waste to be used as cattle feed. It is one of the five C's after all. Um, so it, there's maybe potential there, um, but also uh, possibly redirecting food waste towards our homeless population, which is a very visible problem in Tucson. And I know that it's on a lot of people's minds um, uh, daily. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Nick. And let's hear from Patricia Dow. I think Patricia is going to pass tonight. Uh, Rocky just had to step out. So uh, let's see, who do we have next? Um, my turn. I think the, the most important thing we could do, the, the most wide reaching would be to line up uh, with that plan that you're promoting, Kevin, for a, a more holistic and more community-based approach to developing a zero waste plan. That's like going to the, to the root of all of the, the thoughts and, and possibilities. So I'd like to see your, your enhancement to the city's good start um, incorporated into it. That's what I would recommend. Okay, and oh, Paula. Yeah, I I would definitely um, like to see commercial recycling required uh, as part of the whole program, um, and I think a key thing is education. We need to hammer home to people what is recyclable, what is not recyclable. And if we get into doing any composting, what is compostable and what is not compostable? So we don't run into problems with that. But a continual and regular program educating people on why it's important, what it, and what to do and what not to do. Thank you, Paula. And, and Trace, the mic is open. Okay. Um, well, I had three things uh, come to mind. Uh, the three stream uh, recycling or variations of that is probably quite important because uh, the quality makes a great deal of difference in how usable the stuff is. I think in spite of the legislature's uh, efforts to kill off recycling and such. Um, 
I think it's probably within the city's um, authority uh, to impose business regulations that amount to a, a, a kind of a producer take back process where if you put out packaging, you have to take it back. So all the boxes, cereal boxes and everything else could be recycled uh, through the grocery stores that you buy them from. And we'll have to figure out how to make it that politically feasible. And then the third thing is that um, I fully concur with needing to reduce as much as possible, but it's also important that we develop local manufacturing industries so we're not stuck with global supply chains for everything. So uh, identifying both ways to recover usable materials and encourage businesses that make use of those to make stuff out of would also be important. Oh, thank you, Trace. So we have uh, many rich ideas here. Kevin outlined the, uh, the work of the Zero Waste Committee. And if you've got an idea that's not in that committee yet, uh, you're invited to the next meeting. It, Kevin, that'll be the first Monday of February, is that right? We meet on the second Monday of the month at six okay. o'clock. And if anybody's interested in attending our next meeting, we'd welcome uh, folks um, especially if you want to you know, help us look through and, and investigate and then promote some of these strategies that have been mentioned, um, you know, send me an email uh, to, to sign up. It's, it's kevin at sustainabletucson.org. A memorable email there. Thank you, Janet, for that. And also for those who are checking the chat, Janet put in a URL for a um, song dance parody uh, telling us what not to recycle. And that was produced um, by Jana and team a couple of years ago. So sadly, we are at the closing time. And so we really got through just the first question, but that shows how rich a conversation can be on just one question, at least the beginning of a conversation. Please do consider uh, talking with Kevin directly. Uh, if you'd like to pursue these topics further.